Thank you for joining us. Before we get started with the message, I want you to know that we really care about you and what's going on in your life. If you need prayer, please give us a call, send us an email, or connect with us on our app. We would love to stand with you in prayer. Pastors Dwayne and Jeannie will be starting a new mini-series, Marriage Takes Two. Before we get married, we always think about how wonderful our life is going to be when we have the perfect spouse. Then we meet our spouse and realize they aren't so perfect. But our marriage is going to be rainbows and sunshine anyway. Then we've been married for a month and reality sets in. Today's message, Expectations versus Reality, is all about learning how to connect with God in order to connect better with our spouse. I want to tell you one of the surprising things when I got married. I went into marriage with my own expectations of, you know, what this man was going to be like and how he was going to treat me and all those things. But um, I learned that uh, for him, he wanted me to think like a man. He wanted me to act like a lady. He wanted me to look like a young girl and work like a horse. Yes, praise God. <laughs> I did find... I just have to say something. I have been trained. I have been trained. Uh, okay, I did find another woman who, who discovered probably the same thing, and she wrote down what she would like to be in her next life. She wrote, if you're a bear... She wanted to be a bear, and here's why. Because if you're a bear, you get to hibernate. And you do nothing but sleep for six months, and I could deal with that. And before you hibernate, you're supposed to eat yourself stupid. I could deal with that, too. <laughs> if you're a bear, you birth your children, who are the size of walnuts, while you're sleeping, and you wake to partially grown, cute, cuddly cubs. I could definitely deal with that. If you're a mama bear, everyone knows you mean business. You swat anyone who bothers your cubs. If your cubs get out of lawn, you swat them too. I could deal with that. <laughs> if you're a bear, your mate expects you to wake up growling. He expects you to have hairy legs and excess body fat. Yes, I could deal with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> where do I go from there? All right. If you went to a concert to hear a great violinist, one of the top ten violinists in the world, and afterwards, and you had, you had an opportunity to meet him and talk with him, and you were just amazed at the concert, uh, you, you probably would not go up to them and say, at least you should not, you are just so gifted. You know, I just wish that I had a violin that fit me just right, like you do. And you're just gifted in such an amazing way. Because if you said that, that violinist would look at you and call you something not very nice and say, do you realize that I have practiced eight to ten hours a day every day for 30 years? And it wasn't a gift, and it wasn't the size of the violin. It was the fact I worked at it, and I worked at it, and I worked at it, and I worked at it. Now, the same thing is true with marriage. It says in Proverbs, the wise woman builds her house. It's not talking about the physical structure, but it's talking about the marriage. It's talking about the family. And sometimes we just have the idea that some people, they just happen to marry the right size person. You know, the, the, the right one, right? And that because they married the right one, and, and just, I, I just want to tell you something, there is no right one. Right? Did you hear that? There is no right one. If there was just a right one and one person married the wrong one, it would mess the whole world up. Because then everybody else would be marrying the wrong one. All right? There, there, there is a right type, right? But there's not a right one, right? I think just a right type more important of one. to think is being the right one. That's yeah. the, you know, so often, and we laughed about the expectations and the goofy goofiness there, but um, we, we need to stop and think about what your expectations were when you got married, and, um, and was it for him to be the right one, or for her to be the way, you know, this certain type of person, or, you know, your ex our expectations 
um, when we get married, it's not just about him being the right one or you being the right one. It's about us being right with God, choosing God's ways, and, uh, and doing it God's ways, being with God. And, and I just think if we would expect God's help in our marriage and, and look to him to become more and more Christ-like, we're going to be a much better right one. Absolutely. So not finding the right one, but being the right one. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28, it says, but those who marry will have troubles in this life. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? You don't even need to pray about that verse. You don't need to claim it, but it's just a fact. All right. And, and I know when I got married, I didn't think there were going to be any troubles, any adjusting. Surprise. It, Surprise was right. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, it says that God causes Adam to fall in this deep sleep. And the King James Bible says that he took out one of his ribs. Now, the Hebrew word there is only translated rib one time. It's used multiple times in the Bible, but it's only translated rib one time, and that's the place. It's normally translated sides. He took out one of his sides. Literally That's kind why of like, you need to let me cuddle with you at nighttime because yeah. you have a side You're missing. my side. Yeah, it's I kind just, of like God took part of him out, all right? And, 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 and it's like, yeah, guys, we do not see the whole picture without our wife's perspective. Yeah? I, I, I don't know how it is in your case, but, but Jeannie is gifted in areas that I am not gifted in. Now, uh, about a year ago, a little less than a year ago, Je Jeannie bought... A, a farmhouse, for, kind of like our family getaway, 120-year-old farmhouse, right? And she said, I'm going to redo this farmhouse. And she told me what she was going to do, and I said, don't buy this place. It's a disaster. 120 years old. And she said, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And I said, don't do it. But she decided to do it. Okay? So then... That's a new thought. I thought we did this. No. <laughs> it was not we. It was the. It was the. <laughs> Nevertheless, nevertheless, so, so, so we're, we're doing this, okay, and, and they're, they're redoing everything, and, and I kid you not, they asked my opinion about everything, and I gave them my opinion about everything on this remodel. They did not use my advice one <laughs> time, not one time, all right? It came out amazing, amazing, because they didn't listen to me. <laughs> right. Seriously, like, like it, they, they just, they just, every time I did something, I said something, it was like, they go, let's do the opposite of that and it'll be great, right? If they could like, that part I don't have, she has that part, right? And, and we see things differently, right? We have different expectations, we have different needs. And in Ephesians, did you want to I did want to correct that statement because he picked out red stools oh. to go with my blue island, and we have shiny metal red stools, you know, that yeah, She on. keeps reminding me that they that don't Those are his. They don't go. Oh, no, they look great. They're <laughs> awesome, and he chose them. I just have to let him know, you chose those. Okay. <laughs> stools. <laughs> okay. Did you want to talk about... Uh, where, where it, the, the, the differences between the woman and the man. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I love this. I, it, this was a um, real revelation for me one time when I was going back over Genesis and the, the creation and how he created. And I thought, oh, God, you know, if I'm supposed to be a good wife and I, I just need a better understanding, what, how did you make me and what did you make me for? And so I started taking it apart. And, you know, I don't know what a help meet is. Um, you know, I know what a... Uh, hamburger meat is, but, you know, what's help meat? <laughs> and um, so I, I looked up the words in the concordance and got the definitions, and when I put it all together, um, you know, the first part, help, I could follow that. That means aid. Um, it came from the word to surround and protect, and it's the same word used to describe God. And I thought, that's pretty exciting. It means I need God's help to do that, for sure. And then meat, the other part of that word meant to the part opposite, the other side, sight, yeah, we know we see things different, <laughs> counterpart, and it comes from the word that meant to stand boldly out opposite, 
to announce always by word of mouth to one present, to expose, predict, explain, expound, expound fully, messenger plainly, profess, tell, utter, speak, rehearse, report, show forth. And I think, oh, I have words for a reason. <laughs> Yeah. because God equipped me something differently. And then the shocking thing was that, you know, not having read a lot of Proverbs, it says that, you know, the wise use their words with restraint. And I really recognize that when God made marriage, he made marriage as in his image. He made the family. He made us in his image. And there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I was seeing how the Holy Spirit is the teacher and the comforter and the one with, with that um, explains the word of God he, and the word going out from the Father. And, and I thought, God, we women, without the Holy Spirit helping us, we have the gift of speaking, imparting life-giving words, or without the Holy Spirit and in our flesh, we can use the very um, way, the very gift that we're equipped with, our words, to do very destructive things. We can tear down, we can do all kinds of stuff that brings um, heartache and trouble to our own lives and to others. But, so it was really exciting to see that God made us um, with that strength to be able to, um, yeah. yeah, use words in a So I just think that is way. awesome that it says that she's the counterpart and she stands opposite and she vocally, how many of you men know it? She, she, she vocally, she encourages, uh, she, she's the opposite site, she's the counterpart, she speaks out boldly opposite, announces always by word of mouth to one present to expose, to predict, to explain, to expound fully, to be a messenger, plainly profess, to tell, utter, speak, rehearse, report. She does all that, I'm telling you. All right? So here, man, here's, here's what this is saying. If, if you don't think she's smart, don't marry her. Because she's going to tell you what she thinks every day for the rest of your life. All right? And, and literally, 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 that's what the Bible says that the woman is supposed to do. She's going to see things differently than what the man sees things. And literally, God took part of the man out, one of his sides out. Now, one of the really important things is to recognize each other's strengths and gifts and that not to take offense by it, um, not to, to think, okay, um, she's annoying me because she's just telling me what she thinks and I don't want to hear what she thinks. Um, and then the woman can think, you know, he's just annoying because he's making a decision without asking me what I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was really bothered me. If he made a decision and didn't want to know my, you know, and finally one day we openly did some communicating and I said, honey, I really, it's not essential that you do it my way or if I share something that you totally agree with it. What really is important is that you listen, that you just hear me. And once I know you've heard my perspective, so I know that, oh, now he's seeing both sides of it, and the decision he, can ma he makes, I know it'll be a good one, whether it's the one that he used my perspective or he, he uh, you know, however it comes out, I know I have that confidence. He's seen both sides of the coin. Yeah. Great, now we're going to do it his way, whatever he chooses. I want him to lead the family, and I know he can do it having seen the full picture. Isn't that what you feel like, women? You're not trying to undermine your husband and boss him and tell him that he's got to do your way or no way or the highway. you just like, hey, let me share this. We've got it in us. We want to point out and paint the picture of, I see more than you see. Yeah. So the violinists, they worked at, their, at their, their weaknesses. They worked through things. And the same thing is true in marriage. Good marriages are not accidents. They're because the people worked through the issues. And everybody is going to have some issues. Again, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 28. But those who marry will have some trouble. Everybody, it's the two becoming one. Right? And uh, somebody said they get married, and then they find out which one they're going to be. 
But the truth is, it's supposed to be a melting of the two together. The two become one, not one becomes the other one, right? Ephesians 4, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things together into him who is the head. Now, I think it's very interesting. In fact, Jimmy Evans, who's considered one of the top marriage experts in America, said the Bible does not talk that much about marriage. There are specific marriage scriptures. But he said it's very interesting because it's such a, a huge part of most people's lives how little it's talked about. He said because the truth is if you just put Christian principles to work in your marriage, you'll be, have a great marriage. So he says speaking the truth in love, right? Honesty without love, commitment, and forgiveness can wreck a tenuous connection. So there needs to be more than just honesty, right? It needs to be in love. It needs to be with commitment. And there needs to be that willingness to forgive, right? Uh, when Jesus was asked about marriage by the Pharisees, Jesus made this statement. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. And from the beginning, he said, it was not so. So Jesus talking about the subject of marriage and particularly conflict in marriage, he said the reason for divorce was, was ever even permitted, not that it was God's plan, but the reason it was permitted, he said, was because of the hardness of your hearts. Right. So according to Jesus, I mean, no, he's always right. Okay. He said every time that there's a divorce, there's at least one hard Heart. Now, Ephesians 4.32 kind of gives us a, a really good description of a soft heart and hard heart. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, which is the opposite of a hard heart, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So what Jesus is saying is that in marriage, hard hearts cause a tension, that they cause divorce, they, they cause so much of the alienation. But if we're tenderhearted, the first thing that we do is we forgive one another. And it is impossible to live with somebody 24-7, 365, and not have them say or do something stupid. Right? And, and you, you, literally, what, what needs to happen, we need to forgive. We need to forgive. And again, speaking the truth in love. I got to say something about speaking in the truth in love because um, that's tricky. Very often, if you are, have a truth that needs to be spoken that doesn't want to be heard, there's almost, it's really hard to packaging it anyway. And I realized um, early on in, in the marriage that if I said anything that he didn't want to hear, he perceived it as nagging. <laughs> Well, then that means he automatically, you know, shuts the door like, oh, she's nagging. And it just puts a, if a man feels like, well, and a woman too, nobody likes nag, nagging going on. But if, if they don't want to hear it, and I read somewhere that nagging was when one tries to control the actions of another who doesn't want to be controlled. And so, you know, then I would have to check myself, okay, am I trying to control him or am I trying to inform him? And then what is the right way to do it? And um, I'll tell you a trick, women, a lot of times if, anyway, with my man, is if I can pa package what I need to say in some kind of word picture thing that he can swallow, that he can get it. Sometimes you just have to package it in a pecan pie. <laughs> I, I mean, really, that's wisdom. Sometimes it's just like, you know what, just give him a little bit of something sweet and that he likes, and, and, and then you know, ask for his help to please move the boxes from the garage to the basement. <laughs> it's a lot better than him coming home and just like, when will you ever get those boxes moved? Are you lazy or what? I mean, how many men would rather go move the boxes with that? Or, honey, look at, I baked you a pie. And when you get that done, and uh, you think we could go do move the boxes? I mean, obviously, yeah. it's more motivating. <laughs> to okay, so, so here, here, I think what she's saying, she's saying don't be defensive. Uh, 
you have to realize in marriage, you're, you're, this person loves you. You're a team, right? Uh, you want to grow together. You want to meet each other's needs. Uh, researcher John Gotham says that they, they said he can watch couples for 15 minutes, and with 90% accuracy, he can predict if they will divorce. And he looks for four things. He looks for defensiveness, contempt, criticism, and stonewalling. Right? Defensiveness, contempt, criticism, and stonewalling. He says any one of those four is just very, very dangerous inside of a marriage. Uh, Harvard University study said that for every time that we bring something, a complaint, or something we want to see changed or different in the marriage, there needs to be five times that we're affirming that person. Five times affirming, all right? I appreciate you. You're awesome, all right? But tell them multiple times compared to every time that there's criticism, all right? And I'll tell you, that's hard to do, because especially for those of us who kind of um, store things up, you know, we package them, we, wait, we, 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 we let it um, build up, it may be, you know, I'm not an angry person. I don't get angry, but I will store things up that irritate me to look for the right time to express it. And then when something else piles on top of that, and then, oh, another little irritating thing, and another thing, I, you know, and someday, and I remember one time we were driving, and I was reading to him something that reminded me of a few things on my list. <laughs> and so, you know, I said, well, let's, I just want to talk to you a while. And so he said, okay, you know, he was open to that. I put the book down, and I started to speak, and it became a fire hose. <laughs> and, and I just emptied, I just, it was like I was on a roll, and I just didn't want to quit. You know, he was being quiet, but of course, I probably didn't give him a chance to say anything, but I just, oh, and then this, and I just dumped it all on him, and oh, then I felt so good. <laughs> I felt so good. I felt like, oh, he heard me. He listened to me, and I remember when we got to where we were going, and we, we uh, it was kind of late, and we jumped in bed, and I just felt so good, and I just felt like cuddling and like, ah. Oh. I had just gotten it all, all, I just felt liberated, you know? I just had dumped it all on him. Well, he looked at me with the coldest look, <laughs> like, stay away from me, strange woman. <laughs> I thought I knew you, and now I don't. <laughs> and, um, you know, that probably wasn't the right way of doing it, uh, the communicating and the getting on the same page and, and um, speaking the truth in love and, and working on, you know, sometimes we women want to dump and we want our husbands to be God. And maybe this is really um, easy for pastors' wives, <laughs> even more so than, than, than wives whose husbands are electricians, I don't know. But, um, you know, it's real tempting to want your husband to be your savior. And God invites us to cast all our cares over on him, for he cares for us. And he can handle it at whatever speed you give it to him. <laughs> and, and whatever amount you lay at his feet, he can handle it all. Um, but these earth reflections of the Father God <laughs> need it one at a time. <laughs> and, um, you know, to learn that, wow, control yourself, Jeannie, and just... Um, let me put out one thing that we can resolve and talk about, and, and, and he can share, we can fix it, and then go on with life rather than um, the whole huge dump truck. I don't think I've done that again. Not lately. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Phew. <laughs> right. Malachi 2.14. For what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you've dealt treacherously, yet she's your companion and your wife by covenant. Uh, years ago, Jeannie and I lived in Mexico, and the banking system was very different than it is here. It, it literally, uh, to go cash a check or make a deposit, whatever, could take one to two hours. It was very, very slow. But one of the other things that was different is outside of the bank, almost without exception, 
there would be one or two men with machine guns and one or two inside, right? <laughs> because there was, there, was, uh, there was just so much, so much theft. And they would guard that bank. But really, something that every one of us needs to guard is we need to guard our marriage because there are intruders. You know, marriage is designed to be a club of two. You know, when you get married, it is forsaking all others, right? It's supposed to be this exclusive club of two, right? But anytime anything comes in and takes the priority away from your spouse, it's an intruder. It can be work. It can be kids. Now, now when we say kids, somebody thought, well, they're the most important. Now, you know this, if you just think about it. Those kids are going to be with you 18 years, roughly. And then they're going to be gone. Hallelujah. (laughs) They're going to be gone. But you know who's still going to be there is your spouse. They were there before the kids. They're going to be there after the kids. Right? And uh, you can't even let kids take the priority position of your spouse. Hobbies, TV, internet, in-laws, money problems, investments, affairs, addictions, sports, right? Whatever it is, it cannot take the place that your spouse should have as the number one priority in your life under God. And any time it does, it creates conflict inside the marriage, right? Uh, one of the ways to discern, like, what is, um, what, and it's, this can be hard with the kids. I mean, there are seasons that, you know, you have a new baby, and this is 24-7 major little yeah. person in the house screaming mm-hmm. for attention, and, um, you know, to, to do it together, and to, uh, but is how much time you have with each of these things, um, and what is filling your heart the most. Mm-hmm. And I've shared this so many times, but it just is so helpful. Um, the, the Bible says to delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That is saying God needs to be your first priority. Delight in the Lord. Cause him, let him be the first desire in your heart, the first in your time, your choice in your time. And I thank God that all of you are here on Sunday, that that you've chosen, you've showed that, God, I'm placing you as a priority in my time and in my schedule. I'm making the effort to get together with other believers, worship you, and hear your word. That's, that's a thing that you're doing. And you're doing it with your children. You're not putting your children before God and saying, you know what, um, I'm going to let you just sleep in, and, and uh, we're going to sleep in, and you know, there's, a, there's a, something when, when something comes in your heart, when you see, you know what, that is what I'm, I'm delighting in that is causing my desires to turn away. And mm-hmm. if I'm delighting in the children and, my, and, and the pleasure that they give me, and you know what, he's not really listening to me, so I'm just going to pour myself more into the kids and pour myself more into the kids, and then he's feeling less... Or work or sports or Yeah, he goes or... somewhere else. Anything that we delight in, pretty soon it's consuming our heart, our desires, and, and our decisions that we make. And any time a married couple starts making decisions away from each other, then that means you're not facing the same direction, you're not going to end up at the same destination, which is an awesome, great marriage together. Just can't let part of your heart or your life that your spouse should have go to somebody or something else. No part of your heart, no part of your life. Right? Uh, I remember when years and years ago, uh, a young couple came in. They'd been married less than a year. And uh, I remember when they got married. And uh, they, were just, they were just so in love. But now it's less than a year later, and they're in my office. And I, I'm like, well, what's wrong? And she says, she just said, she said, uh, he just doesn't give me his time. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, it's his mother. Now, his mother was a widow. But she said, every day after work, he gets a call from his mother. And she needs the grass cut. She needs furniture moved. 
she needs him to do something to the car. She said, but every day, every single day, when he gets out of work, she's got in a call, he goes over to her house, and he gets home 10 o'clock, he gets out of work at 4.30, he gets, out of, he gets home 10 o'clock, he gets home at 11 o'clock, and it's every night, it's every night, and, and he's like, well, it's my mother. And I said, yeah, but when God created Adam and Eve, the first thing that he said, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother. And God wasn't talking to Adam and Eve. They didn't have a father and mother, right? He was talking to you and to me. You're, you're, yeah, you, you need to honor your mother, but you're supposed to leave. Your number one priority now is to be your spouse and not your mother. And uh, literally, um, they ended up divorcing because he just would not, would not, would not change. You cannot let any part of your heart or your life that should belong to your spouse go in another direction. It can be a person. It can be a career. It can be a job. It can be sports. It can be a hobby. But any time anything takes a part of your heart or life that your spouse should have, right, you're violating what should be happening inside of your marriage. Thank you for being with us today, but I want to ask you a question before we close, and it's simply this, are you right with God? You know, and if you know in your heart that you're away from the Lord, that you're not right with God, I want to pray a prayer with you. Now, the Bible says this in Romans 10, 13. It says, whosoever, that's you, will call on the name of the Lord. That's what we're going to do, the way the Bible tells us to. And it says, will be saved. So when we say amen, if you pray this prayer from your heart, you're going to be forgiven and right with God. So I invite you right now to just close your eyes, repeat this prayer, make these words your own. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross and I believe his blood paid for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead and I believe he's coming again. And today I receive your forgiveness and I surrender my life to Jesus and I hold nothing back. I thank you, you've heard my prayer that I receive your forgiveness and that you make me a part of your family today and forever in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer from your heart, you are forgiven and you are right with God. But I want to help you keep growing spiritually. So I have a book that I wrote I want to give you free of charge. It's called Your New Life. And it is full of bullet points to help you keep on growing spiritually. And you can download it absolutely free. Just come online and it is going to bless you and help you keep on growing. Keep on walking with Jesus. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life. We are so happy for you. To receive a copy of Pastor's free book, you can go to walkingbyfaith.tv and request a copy of this book be mailed to you. Or you can download it right there instantly. Either way, it's absolutely free. While online, you can purchase a copy of today's message, Expectations versus Reality, in the WBF store. You can also download the scriptures for this message under the On Demand page. Walking by Faith is used across the globe to spread the truth that changes lives on and off the air. To partner with us financially in this great commission, go to walkingbyfaith.tv. We love to hear how God is using Walking by Faith in your life. You can connect with us on Facebook or send an email to your story at walkingbyfaith.tv. Next week, we'll finish up this mini-series learning about our partner's needs. Until then, have a wonderful and blessed week.